John chapter number 13. We're going to start reading down in verse number 21. It says, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it, who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for the reading of your word. Lord, we do thank you again for this opportunity, Lord, to be here tonight. Lord, I thank you again for the opportunity to preach, Lord. Lord, I hate the circumstances that it's under, Lord. We ask that you just please continue to pray and uplift uh, Sister Annette's mother, Linda, Lord. Uh, we just ask you to just touch her, Lord. You know the need and just be with her and help strengthen the family. Just give the doctors the wisdom for what she needs, Lord, that we may see her recover, Lord. Lord, as our pastor has said many times, Lord, as we've already talked about and discussed, Lord, we've always said if the, uh, you're wanting to show up and do something, Lord, the devil's going to fight. And he's not. this isn't going to be the last thing he's going to fight over. This isn't going to be the last thing he's going to do uh, as long as we continue to show up and just worship you, Lord. So I ask you just help us tonight. Lord, just be with what you've laid up on my heart to preach. Just help it be the strength and encouragement to your people. Lord, and we're just so thankful for everything you've done for us, Lord. And we just ask you just continue to bless and help now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The first thing I'm going to look at by way of introduction is we see in verse number 21, it said, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray, uh, one of you shall betray me. Uh, that word testify, we just see the testifying going on. We heard a little bit of the testifying from uh, Sister Brandy. Uh, we've heard a lot of the testifying uh, that goes on in each of our services the last few weeks. And that testifying is just simply about telling the truth. Uh, you think if you're on trial and you've got to testify against somebody, you're just up there telling the truth. And that's all Jesus is doing right here. He's saying, here's what's going to happen. One of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to uh, uh, betray me, and then we all know what happens. We're going to go on here in a little bit. But how often are we willing to testify and tell others the truth about the Savior that we serve? There's too many times that we, we go, I believe, in our daily walk, and we go to work or, or to school or whatever it may be, and we're not willing to testify the great things that God has done for us. You know, you, I, I can show up at work and have plenty of lost people that will tell me uh, all the th bad things and the sinful things they've done over the weekend. How willing are we to tell all the truthful things and the things that went on in the church house? Let me tell you how good God's been to us lately. Let me tell you about the people that God has saved in our services lately. How willing are we to testify of the things of God in our daily day, in our daily walk uh, in this world. Not only do we see the testifying, we see uh, what God showed me, the trance, so to speak, in verse number 22. Then the disciples looked one another, doubting of whom he spake. So I, this is just me. You have to just, you know, give me the, uh, the benefit of my wild imagination of all of them just sitting there looking at each other going, me? Is it, is it you? Is it, is it me? Who was it? Just, just bewildered at what's going on. Just bewildered of what could happen. And too many times, that's we, we sit around, I believe, in this world, and we, we see certain things play out in the Bible, and we look at each other like, I can't believe that happened. Really? How, how much more clear and plain and simple can the Bible be at times? How much more plain and simple can it be preached and brought to us at times by our pastor talking about how the devil is going to attack? And we see certain things that go on, and we, we seem to be uh, astounded by it. Why? These things are all going to come true. Sure. The, the, these things that are in the Bible are taking place right before our eyes. Why do we seem so astounded by it? The, uh, Jesus had told them many times over what was going to happen. But yet still they, here they still are astounded by what he had said. But well, we see the ten minute verse number 23 and verse 24. Verse 23, he says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned unto him that he should ask, ask who it should be of whom he spake. How many times are we afraid to ask God something? How many times are we afraid to ask him of something? Whether it be, uh, we're too, and sometimes it could be we're too ashamed. God's been so good to us, we're afraid to ask him for anything else. But sometimes we just fail to realize how big a God he is. We just, we just talked about. 
I, I, re, I remember those early days of speech therapy. I remember those early days of doing the things with Bella and those early days of not knowing if she would ever talk. Look at her. You think God ain't big enough to do something? I remember the last time we had a, it was the last time we had a meeting or one before that. I don't remember. And, and Sister Lynn talking about she hadn't been able to sing and ask God to pray for her on Monday, one of the, by Wednesday or whatever. She was up here singing. You think God can't do anything? Why then are we so afraid to ask? There's nothing that the sister Bell and, and sister Caitlin saying, there's nothing too great or small that he can't do. But see, too many times we're too scared to ask. Too many times we, we think that God doesn't have the time for us. Yeah, he does. If he didn't have the time for us, he, he, he wouldn't be the God that we know and love and serve. Why are we go through so timid? They're all scared, to, like they're scared to death of Jesus. They've been walking with him on a daily basis, walk with him all this time, yet they act like they're scared to death of him. We see the timid in verse 23. But what you want to look at next is the timing in verses 26 and 27. And we'll get to the thought. Verse 26, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had, get, when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. We see the timing there. The devil entered into Judas after he took the sop. Not beforehand, he did it after. So I'm going to ask you a question along those lines. And this is the question that, that came up when I discussed this at our household uh, about a month or so ago. Did Judas have a choice? Did he have a choice? Now we could say right there that Jesus is not a liar... And that Judas didn't have a choice at that moment because Jesus ain't going to be wrong. He's not going to offer him the stop, and he's not. And, and Judas be able to say, "Nope, I don't want it. Give it to to somebody else." But Judas had a choice up till that point. Sure Judas had a choice up to that point because the Bible tells us after he took the stop, the devil entered into him. So the devil wasn't in him beforehand. Judas got to this point by the choices he had made Amen. beforehand. Before he was sitting there with the Lord, he had choices that he had to make. And that's what I want to preach on with God's help tonight. It's just that simple thought. You have a choice. Amen. You have a choice. There's a lot of things that we have a choice in, but I got these five things that God gave me. The first thing we have a choice in is we have a choice in our walk. In Leviticus chapter number 18 and verse number 4, it says, The Bible says, Ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. We have many instances we could go through, Noah and Enoch and others, that the Bible talks about that they walked with the Lord. We know Adam and Eve walked with the Lord in the garden before they sinned. We have a choice to walk with Him on a daily basis. But too many times, and a lot of times, what happens is in Leviticus chapter number 20, verses 22 through 23, it says, Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments, and do them, that the land, whether I bring you to dwell therein, spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. He's telling them, don't walk with everybody around you. I spew them out and I got rid of them for the things that they did towards me. Be careful not to get yourself walking up with them. And too many times that's what happens to us. We just get to walking with the crowd. We get to walking with whatever the country or our city or our family or whatever it may be. We want to walk with them because we are too afraid to stand out. I shared last night at prayer... Uh, last night at prayer here that this is one of the earliest times I'd ever done my devotion uh, uh, for the next time. I, I like to just pray about it and let God just uh, speak to my heart and sometimes it might happen after Sunday night, sometimes uh, it might be early, but this was about the middle of last week, uh, the devotion for tomorrow. God just really started burdening my heart about something. One big what if. What if we were willing to make the stand? that we see going on in our country today that so many want to make a stand. Those people are standing up for things that they believe in. If we believe God can change things, we believe God can do certain things for anybody, why aren't we willing to take that stand? Why aren't we willing to walk that walk? Why are we so willing to just fall in line with everybody else? 
Our pastor talked about how many churches he was disappointed in that when they started announcing we couldn't have service, we're just willing to roll over and fall right in line. I mean, I, I don't want to get all political and all that, but come on. How serious can this be when we see all the, the, the riots and protests and everything that's going on now and nobody cares? Amen. But I couldn't come to church because sure. we're willing to just walk in line with whatever everybody else does. We have a choice in the walk that we're going to take. We have a choice in where we are willing to walk and what we are willing to do. We have a choice each and every day in the steps that we take and where those steps go. Not only do we have a choice in our walk, we also have a choice in our work. Now, I know this, is, this verse is always used in talking about, um, uh, talking about giving and talking about tithing and those kinds of things. And I'm sorry, bear with me for a minute. I'm going to take this out because I am about to die up here. I shouldn't take my coat off, right? I'm going to throw things around here. That loud sound gave Brother Bobby Cato a heart attack prop if he's watching, right? Woke him up. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 7 says, Every man according as he is purposed is in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Amen. The work that you do for the Lord, cheerfully or grudgingly? Which one? See, we have a choice on how we do those things. We can, we can show up as service, and we can show up uh, 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 to do whatever it has to do. It's like, oh, great, here we go again. i got to go teach Sunday school. I'm so tired of teaching Sunday school. Or we can look forward to coming. Yeah. Brother Ray can show up even out here. He can show up Monday and Thursday and however many times he mows the yard each week. It's like, got to go mow that goofy yard again. Or he can say, praise God, I get to go do something for my Lord. Amen. See, there's a difference in how we do things. We often go to work grudgingly because it's a necessity. We've got, if we want anything, we've got to go to work. If we want to be able to have nice things or go on vacations and those things, we've got to go to work. We do that grudgingly. Does it bleed over into what we do for God as well? Or do we do it because we love it? You know, our pastor talked about doing vacation Bible school. And when I came to him the first time, whatever, however long ago it was, three years or so ago, and did the first one he had done, and he shared a story about somebody telling him before they wanted to do one and show up and, and just things not being done the right way. Because they didn't do it cheerfully. It was grudgingly. Well, I want to do this because I feel like I should do something. That's going about things all the wrong way. God's done so much for each and every one of us. Now, I'm not talking about the last few weeks. I'm just talking about in our lives. Each and every one of us could have stood up tonight and talked about how God has met our needs, how things look bleak for our lives at certain points in time, and how God showed up and did something. Why then should anything that we do for Him be done grudgingly? Anything. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter if it's cleaning toilets. Doesn't matter if it's taking up an offering. Doesn't matter if it's sweeping the carpets. Doesn't matter if it's mowing the yard, teaching Sunday school. Anything we do, we should look at as a chance to give something back to Him. I've missed preaching. Not because I just want to get up here in front of you all. I told you, I, I told you before, before church ever started, I am as nervous as I have ever been. I don't want to screw anything up. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I want revival to break out. I want God to do something. But too many times, we don't do things cheerfully the way we do. We just do things out of, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go to church on Sunday. I'm supposed to go to church on Wednesday. I'm supposed to be teaching Sunday school class. And we just do things out of routine that I talked about the other day. We just do things because we're conditioned to do things. We just do things out of, oh, this is how I do it. This is, and this, and this is what I'm going to do. No, we should be willing to do things cheerfully. We have a choice in our work and how we accomplish it. Isn't it amazing if you have a job that you do, and, and, and you know, I, I'll take, for instance, I went into work on Monday. If, if you read the devotion, uh, what day to do the devotion? Friday. If you read the devotion on Friday, uh, you know what I'm about to say. I, I went to work on Monday, and they told me, they said, you're going to be picking up square bales all day tomorrow. Said, you'll go probably after, at that time, I didn't know. I found out Tuesday, and I got in, went after first break, and you're going to be picking up square bales all day long. Now, I used to do that growing up. Not very often, because it was probably the only thing I hated less, Brother Ray, than working in tobacco, was picking up square bales. I only did it two or three times. But I remember what it was like. So I had the choice. I could look at it as like, oh, man, this is, gonna, this is terrible. 
I got to wear pants instead of being able to wear shorts and be comfortable and go out and mess with hay all day. But I went into it like, I don't have to be in that factory all day today. I get to be outside all day today. It was beautiful. It was beautiful outside. We went out there about 9 o'clock before it got too hot. Man, it was wonderful. I got to see some deer, and they got to see some snakes, and it, it was just a wonderful time. <laughs> I hope Brother Doug isn't watching right now, right? But what I'm trying to say is that made the day a whole lot different than if I went and did it grudgingly. See, we have a choice in our work in what we do for God. That vacation Bible school that I was talking about, that vacation Bible school coming up uh, uh, here at the end of the month, that vacation Bible school is only going to be as good as me and each and every one of those teachers, the effort and the attitude that we have towards it. If we look at it like, we've got all these bunch of little brats running around here for all week, and we've got to take care of them and teach them, and man, and, and they, can't, they won't listen, and we get this one together and this one together and, and, and all this, and if we look at it that way, nothing's going to happen in it. And the kids aren't going to enjoy it, and we're not going to enjoy it. But if we look at it as an opportunity to touch a kid's life, who knows what God could do? God has saved kids in it before. He could save some in it this time. We have no idea what God can do. We have a choice in the work that we do for Him. The third thing, we have a choice in our worship. In Acts chapter number 26 and verses 24 through 25, and I know this is a little bit different, well, this is Paul giving an account to King Agrippa for himself. And he's talking about where he came from to what he is right now. And if you're familiar with the story, we get down here in verses 24 and 25. And it says, And as he had thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. If God tells you to stand up and run tonight, are you going to stand up and run, or are you going to be afraid that Brother Clint's going to look at you funny? Brother Phil stood up and made a lap here, whatever it was last week, the week before. I don't remember when it was, but he stood up and made a lap. He didn't care what any of the rest of you thought. Why do we worry so much about what somebody else thinks about in our worship? If I get up and go to the altar in the middle of the preaching, and Brother Donald wants to sit over here and think, well, I wonder what he's going to the altar for. I wonder what he's got going on. That's a Brother Donald problem, not a me problem. I don't mean to pick on you, Brother Donald. I'm sorry. You get on him, Miss Crystal. Tell him. Quit worrying about everybody else. But too many times, I know I'm guilty of it. I'm just going to assume maybe if I'm guilty of it, others are too. We're afraid to do certain things. We're, what's everybody else going to think? Well, if I stand up and let out a hallelujah, what's everybody else going to think? Is everybody going to look at me funny? Well, Brother Josh don't ever do that. What's, he's just doing that for show. I've never, seen, I've never seen Brother Jack get up and run before. What's he doing getting up and running? What's he got to be so excited about? See, we get too caught up in what other people think. We should just show up ready to worship. If God tells us to raise our hand and we don't normally raise our hand, raise your hand. If God breaks you down and you start crying and start in tears, just, just let it go and cry. No worried about what somebody else thinks. But see, we get so caught up into thinking we got to act and do a certain thing. Who says? Hopefully we've all been around here long enough to know that, hey, if God tells you to do it, do it. If it's stand up, if it's shout, if it's cry, if it's go to the altar, if it's run a lap, if it's run outside and run around the building like Brother Charlie did one time, whatever it may be. building's a lot bigger to run around, though, now, ain't it, Brother Ray? I don't think I'd want to do that now than what he used to back in the day. I was here at one of the revivals. Brother Charlie went out the side door over there and ran around. We was just in the old building. This, this is a much bigger lap now. What I'm trying to say is we have a choice in our worship. Amen. We have that choice, and that choice a lot of times happens before we ever get here. What is the attitude we're going to bring in to each and every service? What is the attitude, how have we prepared our hearts out there before we get into here? That's what I love about the last few weeks and the services we've had. As you can tell, it, it, it's a sweet spirit that starts even in the fellowship time beforehand. Not after, it doesn't take the congregational singing, it doesn't necessarily take a prayer. It's we've come in ready to see God do something. See, we have a choice in our worship. Now, you could have come in and you might not have gotten anything out of the last few weeks. That's been your choice. That's been your, you're the one that has chosen not to get help. You've been the one that's chosen to come in and sit like a stump on a log and just, and just go through the motion. That's been your choice. And you can have that choice. You can do that. Or you can come in and just look forward to seeing what God's going to do for you. You have that choice in your worship. The fourth thing is you have that choice 
in the wisdom that you have. What does the Bible tell us in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15? Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Closed communion. Do we know where it's at and why we teach it? Baptism. What do we teach about baptism? Do we know where it's at? How much do we know about God's Word? Now, if we don't know anything about it, that's our choice on how much we study. See, we have a choice in how much we know about God's Word. We have a choice in the wisdom that we're willing to put in. Nobody else. Nobody else can make us study because if somebody else tells us this is what you're going to do, we're not going to do it to try to retain anything. We're just going to read it and be done with it. But if we truly want to learn more about God, and we truly get into His Word, and we truly uh, uh, put that time in that we do what 2 Timothy 2.15 says, it doesn't say to read, it says to study. If we're willing to put that in, He'll give us that wisdom that can help us. That if we're in that situation tonight that we have a loved one in the hospital, if we're in that situation tonight where we're the one that got news that maybe we have cancer or we've got something else wrong with us, that that we've got enough of that wisdom in us to know that God's going to take care of us. We've got enough of that wisdom to know uh, who to go to maybe for some advice or who to go to to help uh, give us scripture that can uplift us and get us through the times that we're going through. But we have that choice. We have that choice on the wisdom that we have but too many times we think we can just open it and read it and and go through the motions and we don't retain anything and we've never learned and never gotten closer to God we've stayed in the same place our pastors talk about it people that have been saved 25 30 years or more and they're in the same place now that they was then they've not put forth the time and effort to study to learn more about God and get closer to him to allow God to do something in their life we have the choice in our wisdom all these things brought me to the last thought you look at Judas obviously we have multiple accounts to know that he is one of the twelve so you know what he did he walked with Jesus by all accounts there were certain things that Judas probably worked and did for the Lord as he walked with him He walked with him. He worked for him. He was there with him here, and and, and he worshipped him. And and he he seen all the miracles that he did. So you would think that he's got the wisdom to know who Jesus is, to know what Jesus is all about. He he has seen this man perform miracles. He has seen him feed the thousands with just a few loaves and a few fishes, Brother Clint. He He has seen him help the blind made to see. He has seen him do all these things. But yet he betrays him. Why? The same choice that we have tonight. You have the choice to decide where your heart's at. Judas seen all this take place, but his heart wasn't after God. His heart was for himself. His heart was worried about the money. We know that he stole, we we know the things that he did. His heart was about all those things. Where's your heart at tonight? See, Brother Doug can't make your heart be in revival. Brother Josh can't make your heart be in revival. Nobody else can make your heart be in revival. Nobody else can make your heart be towards any, any of the things of God. You have to be the one that does that. And see, when our heart's not in it, we're just not going to be involved in it. We're just not going to be uh, uh, willing to give to it the way we should. Why is everything that God does for us so wonderful? Because he loves us. His heart's in it, so to speak. He gave his best for us. That's what they're saying about up here. He gave his only son. He gave everything for us because his heart was in it. He he has a love towards us like we just can't understand and comprehend. What is our heart in towards him? See, it's all about where our heart's at. You know, you think, you you look at somebody that's that's been married for, for a long time. You know, they can tell when somebody, when you do want something for the other, if your real heart's really in it or not. Amen. You know, the, uh, uh, Sister Crystal and Brother Donald, newlyweds. I'm sure she can tell if he does something for her, if his heart's really in it or not. We all can. 
you know, whatever happens out of that, whatever the, the results of something is, we can tell how much our heart was in it. We, we, you can tell when, you know, I talked a little bit about Vacation Bible School. You can tell Vacation Bible School comes up the teachers whose hearts are in it and those who are just doing it. You can tell the ones that are really putting forth everything that they can in it. If you're somebody like me, look, we, we, I picked on Brother Josh before service about singing. If he didn't want to sing, that means he can probably sing just about as good as I can. I try to get Sister Dawn to sing, and she, and she, she, she talks all the time when we go to jail about that she can't sing. You know, I can't sing any better either. But you know what? If your heart's in it, it's all that matters. You get up here and you put your heart into it, it doesn't matter. Look, as great as a God is, and Sister uh, uh, and Miss Bella can, can, can be able to sing enough to be able to come up here and sing, you know why we understand it and why she does? Because her heart's in it. She just loves to get up and sing. She'll belt that song out all the time at home. See, if our heart's in it like that, it doesn't matter what we sound like. Because I'm not going to pay attention to how you sound or anything or not. I'm just going to listen to the words. I'm going to see the tears coming down your face. I'm going to see what God has done for you, and that's what's going to show forth. Sure. That was Judas's problem. Sure. He had a heart problem. He walked with the Lord, did works for God, worshipped Him, did all those things that we talk about we should do. But his heart still wasn't in it. You have a choice today. Is your heart in it? Is your heart in revival? I shared last night. I told our pastor... I told him, I told Sister Dawn here when, when he announced it, and we've already got a vacation planned, and, and, I, and I told him, I said, I said, well, here's what I'm praying, that God just break it out and go two weeks, Brother Ray, because then I'll get a week's vacation and a week revival coming back, Miss Melissa. <laughs> and, and Brother Doug talked about that yesterday morning, or yesterday afternoon, yesterday morning, I seen him for a minute, and, and he said that, and he told Brother Greg, that he said Brother Greg could come back if, if that's what God wanted. And the more I got to think about it, I shared this last night, Brother Ray, at prayer. I just want God to do something. Yeah. I don't want it to go two weeks just so I can come back and have revival. I don't want it to go more than a day if God's not in it. I just want us to pour our heart into it, and whatever God wants, that's what God wants. Whether we meet for a Monday and Brother Doug said, hey, look, God showed up, did something in the church, gave him something in the community, let's, we're done. If that's what God wants, then that's what God wants. But we should just be willing to put our heart and soul into it no matter what that means. Whether that means we're, we give extra money to, and I'm not preaching on tithing, whether we give extra money to be able to give a good love offering, whether we spend that extra hour of time this week in prayer for Brother Bobby and Brother Greg and anybody else who might be coming, whether we spend that extra time in prayer for our pastor to give him discernment, whether we spend that extra time in prayer and studying, whatever it is of just get putting our whole hearts into seeing God do something. I said last night, I want to be that church. Our pastor alludes to it all the time. What could God do with one church being completely sold out to him? What could we do? But too many times, we don't have our heart into it because we want to think, I can't make a difference. And that keeps us from doing what God would have us to do. You have a choice tonight. You have a choice before revival comes up. I'm putting your whole heart and soul into it and seeing God do something. We can put our whole heart into it, or we can be like Judas and go through the motions and sell God out for the next thing that comes in line. You have a choice tonight. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, if you'll come and get your guitar. Let's pray as he picks out a song to sing. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again tonight, Lord, for everything you've done for us, Lord. I just want to thank you for being a great God. Lord, thank you for giving us that choice. Lord, you're never one to come and push yourself on us. You're never one to, uh, to make us do anything, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for being that God that just says, here it is, and leave things up to us, Lord, and how we're going to deal with them, what we're going to do. Lord, we just ask again, just thank you for the message. Thank you for this time here this evening, Lord, and ask you to just be with this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.